Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Meeting is recorded. So, um, this session is like planned for those who are interested in security. Um, the previous one was a bit messy because there are yes. people. Hmm? Yeah, I know. Yeah. It's it is yeah. Uh, okay, but it's recorded here on uh, on uh, on this microphone as well. Yeah. Okay. Good. We'll see. Uh, at least uh, we, we when we made the sound check, it was uh, working. So um, and it was a kind of a general one, and uh, this one is a opportunity not only to stick to the agenda and the slides that I have, but uh, what we typically do with the security sessions. We also try to make it as practically useful as possible and discuss your real life cases as well. Questions, topics to raise that are not on the list. So I have uh, quite a lot of slides, uh, but uh, it's not an obligation to go through all of them and we can stop anytime. We having a flexibility, having a really small audience here, we can discuss or dive in really in the topics that they are interested. So um, to emphasize uh, like a bit more, it's uh, everything related to cybersecurity, everything related to privacy and other compliance efforts, standards, certification, and other things. And uh, maybe a bit of risk management, but it's uh, kind of a, a bit artificial. And uh, this is this is a plan. Um, I have another document for this session where you can also put comments and ask answers. And uh, uh, once you open it, uh, you will also see the link to the previous one. And I also updated some answers uh, to the questions that I had. So, uh, yeah, and uh, there were some topics that we didn't cover for this, uh, that session, and it, it might, might be easy to... Uh, switch between two uh, files, but they're, they're kind of separate. And uh, we'll stop at some point of time and make a break. Um, so let's, yeah, uh, I'll just to put like a bit of context. We'll talk about the HS2 security features first, um, just to recap what is in place and what you can use. Um, I'm pretty sure that most of you are aware about that. Uh, this is the first part. The second part is more technical. Uh, it is about uh, most important steps for implementers to do on security or remember kind of a high level checklist of what to do on security once you have existing system or plan new installation. And uh, the third part, it is even more technical. Uh, it is about um, typical security misconfigurations and uh, we can go there and discuss or we can uh, do uh, like a Q and a session around these topics as well. That's that's it. So um, we'll start with and although many of these things are listed now on the website, uh, I'll put some accents on what is like not not written there because uh, it is a uh, more implementation specific. Okay, um, we start with access control. This is a key functionality and it is a kind of a natural to everyone. So we have users, we have admins, uh, and we would like to restrict access to certain features. We can have a quite complicated in country structure and we can have um, different data regions, we can have different data types, uh, metadata and other things that require quite fine grained access control. Um, the functionality is in place, but as long as you start configure it, configuring it, one of the like biggest changes is that the more detailed access control you'd like to have, um, the more difficult it is to maintain it. And uh, the immediate recommendation is that once you start managing your system grows, you have users coming, leaving, you assign different groups, roles, permissions in general, 
uh, at some point of time, especially after two, three, four years, it becomes quite hard to maintain this set setup. And uh, this is in product feature on one side. On, this, on the other say, side, uh, it should be possible to make the administration easier. So the non-system, uh, like the answer or the recommendation outside of the system is to have a access control policy, but not as a public policy for everyone, but the set of internal rules on how you grant permissions, some internal rules on how you assign permissions to different categories of users. For example, you can say that, okay, we now, so we once we create a new responsibility or once we create a new type of activity, we always create a new role for that to ensure that one type of function within the organization always has, has a corresponding uh, role in the system. Or we have a new title for a person and we always have only one group of permissions for this role. Or if we change the title as a promotion or someone moving from one department to another, we remove all the previous roles and assign the new ones. So this kind of a basic rules and um, they may seem quite pretty straightforward, but once the system grows, uh, it helps to keep it tidy and clean within the setup. And as long as you don't have that, it becomes um, uh, quite hard to maintain it. We, uh, on our side, uh, we think about making a tool to validate permissions internally and give some advice on what is assigned in incorrectly as a web app. But uh, I have a kind of a very, very early draft of the application and uh, it uh, still like requires a like, couple of months or maybe three months to uh, develop the rest and uh, share for, for for like test, test, test use. But the immediate recommendation is to keep things tidy. Right. Uh, second one everyone knows is LDAP authentication. Um, it's also core functionality. We support most of the existing uh, LDAP com compatible directories. Uh, you all know them Active Directory, Azure OD, Open LDAP. Um, for like, yeah, so um, many people think that it is a kind of a really good, it, LDAP was invented like 35 years, 40 years ago, and it is a kind of a de facto standard, but we also need to understand that once you have a LDAP connection to the, to the server, uh, it means that uh, between DHS2 server and the LDAP server, it means that the user enters password into DHS2, then this password is sent to the LDAP server and then validated on that side. So as long as we trust all the components, it is kind of okay, but in any case, the password in a clear form is transferred through DHS2 instance. Um, for new setups, uh, we recommend using OAuth authentication or any other method that doesn't require us to submit a password to DHS to some kind of an external authenticator. So 10 years ago, LDAP was perfect. Nowadays, it is a kind of still still a standard, still it's a kind of a default solution, but where we can use an external single sign-on uh, or similar uh, authentication, it's better to, to use it in, in, in any way or plan new systems, not relying on the LDAP itself directly. For us nowadays, it's a backend service just because LDAP uh, processes or the, the implementation of LDAP processes passwords in a clear form. And if anything wrong happens with the DHS2 server, it's kind of exposing the password to the uh, to the backend of the attacker. Uh, next uh, famous lovely thing that uh, uh, is a kind of standard everywhere and uh, everyone loves or hates it depending on uh, the personal experience. Um, many of you we know use it uh, if using Google Authenticator uh, or similar compatible app, you can use also if your organization uses Microsoft Authenticator, any third party, you, you are not obliged to use the Google one. So for new devices, you can use any 
one where you can scan a QR code and it should be compatible for all kinds of platforms and phones. And uh, not all of you know that there are also multiple open source uh, applic uh, authenticator applications for feature phones. So if your users use legacy feature devices, um, there, are, there are apps uh, that can support uh, two-factor codes on the legacy devices. So the only requirement is to have a J uh, Java or g 2 e support on these devices and you can scan uh, the code from the or enter the code from the, from the uh, get the code from the legacy device as well. So you just install this kind of app uh, in the same way as uh, games and uh, you can use it. It's called free OTP or several other things. Uh, if you need more details, we can discuss it a bit further on. Yeah, and uh, we've got several requests to implement email based uh, second factor and uh, we are working on this because it's a bit problematic because not uh, always uh, it's always reliable. Do you know what is the most important thing for two factor authentication to work? And do you know what is the most important thing for two factor authentication to work in general? What what breaks two factor uh, if it is not implemented? It's time synchronization because both uh, the phone you have and the server should have the same time because they rely on the same time generator. And for example, the server thinks that it is one time and your device has a different time and the code like uh, that, that is for 60 seconds, for example, or 30 seconds, it expires before the server can if you have different timing. So they don't agree on time. So it's important. So many people complain, oh, our factor doesn't work. And maybe just because uh, the server doesn't have accurate time or the client has a device where the time is not synced for whatever reason. So this is the biggest problem to check. And typically uh, one of the general security recommendations that is, is before running um, any system, you need to ensure that you have a reliable time source that all the servers you have, they have a, a synchronized time for authentication purposes, for uh, better cryptography operations, and for uh, ensuring that your log records are accurate so that you get the correct, accurate timestamp on logs all the time. Yes? For two-factor authentication, uh, we use Google Authentication. Mm -hmm. They said that you also support the Microsoft Authentication. But the one common request from the government was to include the SMS based authentication. Mm -hmm. So, SMS based OTP, we can also include that in the future. Yeah. Uh, we got this request. So I mentioned that we have an email based uh, authentication request where you send an email to the. Uh, yes. That's the, yeah. Yeah. yeah, exactly. It's not there, but it's, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, this was a request. And uh, we have it in the backlog for SMS, but uh, I, I'm not I'm not certain we are going to discuss the security roadmap uh, next week. We actually submitted, I yeah. think, Yeah, could be, yeah. Done. Yeah, but great for the, great for the reminder. Um, you, you, I've shared uh, the link, I'll scroll back. One more file with a QR code, it's an, another one. So if you can, Put as a reminder there. I I <laughs> I'll remember for myself. But if we can like promote this feature a bit and write it down to the comments, it would be great. Right. Okay. Um, single sign-on. Uh, I mentioned earlier that it is a preferred way to do authentication if you have a supporting infrastructure. And the main idea for single sign-on is that you don't transfer password between any parties. So it is only the authenticating server that received the, uh, the password compared to LDAP. And it is not literally stored or like transferred to any kind of a third party system. Also um, with a proper setup, if you have it, you can smoothly log in users once and they keep the session running uh, for all the apps that are authenticating through the same system. Um, we've got an experience of uh, many organizations uh, using uh, Okta or Keycloak as a different solutions on the commercial and like op open source part. 
but uh, and uh, they say that, uh, for example, it, it improved their experience a lot because uh, people don't need to remove, uh, remember multiple passwords. They don't need to log in that often, and it is easier to block users in one place rather than to go through all the systems and uh, checking there. Yeah, so it's uh, heavily recommended. Or if you don't have it in your organizations, you can, for example, kick off with a single sign-on implementation using one of the, for example, available solution and promote and onboard other system owners to use it as well. Um, new thing, relatively new thing, uh, we use uh, the personal access token if you would like to do some automation. So uh, it's a replacement or like a set of passwords. You can use tokens that allow you to create uh, automated integrations and you access different data based on your permissions, but without the need to hard code passwords anywhere. This is still kind of a new feature and uh, it uh, still requires uh, like extra security reviews and considerations anyway, because it allows it to, uh, mm, to log in, like theoretically to log into a system in another way, non-trivial way, kind of a hidden way, but uh, it is still quite useful and can simplify day-to-day -day integration experience. Uh, user impersonation, this is a new thing, uh, also made by request uh, and it allows you to run reports uh, or functionality as a different user. So uh, there are multiple ways of how it may, may be used, uh, but uh, typical to like another user mode to kind of act as, uh, work as uh, pseudo Linux or other things. So this is quite new, uh, appears in 214. Um, yes? Yeah. Is it there? Is it Say it again? By default, the can any user. What's the benefit of introducing user? By default, the administrator can go on behalf of any user. Yeah, uh, if you are not an admin, but you would like to run specifically configured reports in the batch mode, or for example, when some user is on vacation and you don't want to share the credentials, you can allow someone else to run a report on behalf of this user. So if you have settings specific to, to a user, you can uh, kind of uh, connect his or her working in environment and run specific reports to this user. Yeah. So of course, as an as a admin, you can uh, perform certain things, but you will not pick up all the environmental settings, all the setups yeah. for, for the user. Yeah. That's yeah, but if you would like to make a report, and it's also restricted to the admin level only, but uh, the idea was to bring in like all the work environment for user and setups. Oh. Yeah. Auditing and logging, um, also core functionality, uh, user activity log, system event log. And uh, we know that not many of you use uh, like custom custom logging format for the system events, but it is possible to configure different types of uh, event logging for, for system, I mean, uh, DHS2 and Tomcat application itself, not the user activity log, which is separate, but uh, not or activity or audit or change log, but the set settings that are available, you can edit log for, for J configuration uh, file and uh, introduce the kind of uh, extra extra logging parameters. Okay. Uh, yeah. Here we might need uh, to consider to add one of the logging for the device and the IP. So that's become a crucial uh, specificity when you are using track. Mm -hmm. For example, during COVID pandemic, there is some, uh, you know, the uh, corruption is there. So we have to track down users who is actually involved in this. Mm -hmm. So we that's quite difficult because that's actually not put in the document log. So that we find it from the uh, Nginx log. So Nginx can track the IPs and others. Yeah. But when we uh, pass it to the application, that's not. So if there is any way we can track down the specific device yeah. or IP, then we can 
pinpoint the specific person who's responsible. Yeah, typically once, and uh, we will probably discuss a bit later, but as I, as I, as I asked right now, probably it's the right right time to discuss it a bit. So um, if you look at the whole like DHS to set, set up, so you have a Tomcat web server that runs uh, uh, a WAR file and application in a container, and you have a database. And you can put uh, Nginx or Apache or any other uh, reverse pro proxy in front, and uh, once a user connects to DHS to server, uh, they connect through the web proxy. So uh, from the web proxy, the, and the, the web proxy knows the source IP of the user. Then Nginx takes a request from the user and sends it back, back to Tomcat. And in default setup, Tomcat see, sees that all the requests come from the Nginx. So he can't distinguish one user from another. And uh, from the DHS2 container or Tomcat perspective, all users come from the IP address of the Nginx, which may be on the same machine, which makes uh, the task uh, of identifying or distinguishing users very difficult. So um, there are different ways to approach this. So on one side, uh, there can be an update to application to send some data, like unique ID of the session to the, to the user. The second is, uh, uh, setting on Nginx that allows to pass user IP address, uh, the client IP address through Nginx to the backend server. So there are special headers that can be configured to be sent to the backend server. So the real IP of a user appears in DHS2 system logs. Yeah. So if you need a kind of guidance of how to configure that, we can do it in the like in the pulse or I can write it down after after the session in in the file. So it is it is pretty standard, but it is not like recommended by default. And depending on host or virtual host configuration, there are, there may, may be some differences on how to do that. But it's it's possible, and I think that to some extent it will like be a quick and reliable fix. Uh, we typically say about backup, uh, but the idea is that we should make a backup of the system itself and store the configuration of, of the database itself, but also store system configuration somewhere because in the case of the data loss, it's important to not to uh, to restore not only the database, but also to keep the same system configuration to uh, back up the DHS to config, the operating system environment, the Postgres uh, settings, and then and so on. Uh, we have a whole repository of DHS2 tools that uh, can help with automated setup. So it, in fact, replaces backup. So you can, for system configuration, so you can always reinstall the system from this, this setup. And uh, the, the second is we can just have a scripts uh, to perform a regular backup of the database and restoration. Um, one of the like important things is that once you make a backup, it's always a good idea to ensure that you can restore from this backup. So uh, there were some cases where the backup was not usable and making this uh, procedure in emergency mode is very, very painful. And uh, you're under stress, you uh, never know how it will succeed or not. And it takes time, and you're limited of time, and your users are waiting. So it is recommended to make a test backup just to try how it works on the test system and see if if you can actually restore from the backups you have. It is it is not like guaranteed uh, by from the procedural operational point of view. So it's it's really worth test testing. And uh, the next thing that we started kind of not promoting, but we started using uh, last year and expanded a bit this year is virtual patching. So um, we also briefly discussed it uh, today through, uh, through the day that um, if you have a, a DHS2 server running behind the reverse proxy, and there is a well-known security vulnerability or new security vulnerability, you can partially mitigate it uh, or in some cases you can mitigate it by installing a special patch to the Nginx or Apache configuration. Now, if you just run a regular Tomcat, we can handle 
uh, these patches on the Tomcat level itself, uh, adding uh, uh, snippets, configuration snippets to the container. So you can have a patch deployed immediately while we are waiting or preparing an upgrade or just closing the hole uh, before you upgrade to the new version. Um, it is very vulnerability dependent. So there are some vulnerabilities that can't be fixed by virtual patching, but in some cases it's very useful because it helps to restrict either the insecure functionality, either to eliminate the problem or to introduce some temporary fix before we have a, a full-time and a, like a long-term solution. Right. And um, any other questions so far? Yes, please. Can we have Redmi plugin so that they can be Can we have Redmi plugins so that they can be plugins? Can we have Redmi plugins so that they can be plugins? Sometimes there are two post editors where uh, they support continuously by the password for many times. So, can we uh, limit the number of logins or can we limit the IP address for a specific region? Oh. No, not really. Uh, uh, not within the HS2 itself, uh, but using either reverse proxy or by using uh, Tomcat functionality. So rate limiting is a kind of expensive operation. And uh, you, your Tomcat is generally busy with processing user requests, like legitimate user requests. And uh, if it has to also to handle the denial service attack or like all kind of a brute forcing, it means that it will be distracted and will consume more and more resources on like uh, through pushing back on the uh, malicious requests. So, uh, but it is still possible, for example, to do it on the Tomcat level. Uh, there are filters and rate limiting walls that are available in the Tomcat starting from version eight. So if you run Tomcat eight or nine, you have uh, an opportunity to configure it internally. This is, this is one thing. Then, uh, but the recommendation is not to do it on the Tomcat level, but to uh, employ a reverse proxy for this purpose. And then you have Nginx or Apache in front that can do it for, for you. So standard rate limiting in Nginx works pretty well. Request throttling, like reducing it to works pretty well. You can make, if we use Lua scripts and additional functionality in Nginx, you can query the geolocation database and uh, restrict um, answers, like restrict the responses per, per region, uh, just checking or the region of the country uh, specific for this request and just block, block users based on the IP address detection. So this is possible. Uh, Lua scripting is a bit more like complicated, but I think if you have tried chat GPT, it can give the kind of a basic recommendation on how to configure NG, at least Nginx for, for this purpose. But the idea is the same, you just uh, pre-process request and reject it if uh, the user doesn't ma match criteria or exceed the acceptance threshold. Mm, yeah, at the same point of time, it's quite like it requires like a heads up, it requires a lot of like testing because if you have a lot of users sitting behind one IP on the network address translation, it uh, may, probably cut them off. So you need either to have different buckets or you need to to uh, to be very, very smart. Yeah. Yes, please. Uh, I have something like that. Because uh, in our case, we have the similar issue. So uh, actually, we are uh, nationally, we are using the other firewall. Mm -hmm. So to correct any extent. So we use the Cisco firewall. We configure that way. So if it is out of reason, more request is there, the suspicion will be blocked. Mm -hmm. So that will be next day, and what if I ask to replace that or not? So we check whether this is valid, then we might test it. Yeah. Otherwise, we we'll yeah, uh, that, that's a good approach. Uh, for user blocking, so there is an, another issue that if you, for example, have entered the password, incorrect password for multiple times, the account will be suspended for some, for some, some time. 
Um, it is a kind of a well-known behavior and it is still implemented in all Microsoft systems. So for Windows, for Active Directory, uh, it's typically, if you have unsuccess like 10 unsuccessful attempts, your account is blocked for one hour. Uh, from my perspective, it's a kind of a old school of, let's say, legacy or bad approach because it, it makes it easier to lock out the legitimate users. And if you have a, either a malicious actor who use, knows the usernames or there is a misbehaving application service, you can easily cut off your legitimate users uh, before uh, they can do actually anything without any, any concerns. And uh, it may be a bigger threat than just uh, allowing to brute force, force the password. So uh, we continue, and uh, the next thing to discuss is a security checklist that, from my perspective, should start with every implementation. Uh, many of you have heard about OWASP top 10 for software, uh, secure application development, and this one, like uh, 10 uh, important things for DHS implementers to know about security. And we will go one by one uh, and uh, discuss uh, them uh, in a bit in details. First thing is not very technical. And uh, it's about defining roles and responsibilities. Just to ensure that you know who is doing what and that you um, have clearly defined who is responsible for security and who is responsible for incident uh, follow-up and uh, communication and other critical things. Um, after the incident happened or under, when you are under attack, it might be hard to find out who is actually doing what. And the main purpose of it preparing in advance is to ensure that people, you have some roles assigned. And the second, you can train and inform and educate people on what to do in case of an incident. So there are two like, things here. And also check that there are important things that people should do in your teams and that they're not overlooked and you have clearly assigned all the roles and responsibilities related to security. Uh, it can be as simple as one person responsible for everything security related, or it can be more difficult, someone for privacy, someone for technical security, someone for communicate crisis communication, so on and so on. So it depends uh, on the use case. Um, if you're interested, we can dive in and discuss the more like the different scenarios as well. Second thing, uh, often overlooked, and it's not a trivial task, especially if your organization is quite mature, create an inventory of assets. So um, it's just to know your attack surface and what can be attacked in, in general to ensure that there are no surprises. You don't have any forgotten systems, don't have any assets that nobody owns, maintains, remains. Uh, it can apply to servers, workstations, uh, all kinds of uh, anything connected to the network. It can be about user accounts. It can be about uh, whatever uh, has potential value and can be compromised. Um, the most trivial and the, the most unfollowed advice is back up the data. So we've met it all the times and it was my recommendation number nine, but I moved it to number three because people still don't do backups or the backup is half a year old and it's not usable or we can't restore. And uh, once you get an inventory of assets, you can understand what you should back up and what should not. Very straightforward, but, but still. Um, also, it is important to maintain security of the backup data in the same level as you maintain the security of the main main systems system. One of the very, very typical attack scenarios that happens in real life an attacker, for example, got on the local network. You have a DHS2 installation running, secured according to best standards. And then someone else in your team who has no clue about DHS2, he just does a backup. 
has a backup server and there are no security practices there. So then an attacker can compromise the backup server, extract the backups from the extracted backups, decrypt the VHS2 admin passwords and log into the main system as easy as that. And if the responsibility is not clearly defined or is split between different people, um, attacking test or backup or any kind of a secondary systems uh, is a very, very popular way of uh, privilege escalation or attacking anything. If you can't go like through the front door, you can find a back door, which is probably open. Um, as we mentioned during the first session today, authentication still remains the biggest problem. And uh, it can start from guessing the passwords using default passwords. So we always tell that you please change admin district as soon as possible. And we find, still find production instances in the real life that don't follow this advice. And uh, multi-factor, single sign-on, uh, not using passwords for SSH and uh, using keys for that. So general standard security requirements apply here. Um, number five is about access rights and permissions. And uh, we discussed it a bit that it's important to have a, um, internal guidelines of how you do security or access control and how to maintain access control to keep things clean and tidy. And uh, it is typically a company with a regular review, access rights review. So once you define who has, uh, should, should have rights and what are the um, main actors, the groups of users, their responsibilities and roles, it is much easier to do a regular checkup once you have this kind of a internal guidelines for that. Uh, often there are things that are overlooked, uh, temporary accounts, uh, API permissions, uh, API keys and uh, all kinds of uh, non-interactive permissions. So there are, there is a plenty of things. That's why important, the inventory is important. And um, here it's a kind of a short break and recap. So we talk about inventory because inventory helps to create and maintain the attack, uh, the, like uh, the, to have an overview, overview of the potential attack surface. We introduced some rules to simplify our life for access control. And then we harden the systems uh, based on the inventory we have and the roles and the importance of the permissions and the, the users in the system. So this is a kind of a mutual effect and all these things don't, don't work with, without each other. So if you don't have an inventory, you can't make a uh, good access control or you can't harden the system because you don't know what you have. And uh, if you don't have clear roles and responsibilities, you can't uh, uh, act in case of the incident or you don't know who, what kind of access should have. So it is deeply interconnected and you can't do just one piece and think that you're secure. Um, we continue. Uh, so number six is uh, network configuration. And uh, We've been in touch with several teams that maintain DHS2, and on certain level, those who do system administration for uh, or app administration for DHS2, they uh, have no clue about what's going on on the network level. Uh, but uh, and uh, networking is kind of a standalone, self-contained thing for them. So I would say that uh, even if you, if you don't have it under your control, it's good to have a regular sync up with the networking team to understand what kind of uh, security measures they have and do you need to work together to make your system secure together. Mm, also, in the recent years, uh, many of you use VPN uh, for accessing the organization's network. In the recent years, then, a lot of new VPN related technologies. For example, many people started using WireGuard, which is a kind of a lightweight alternative to classical VPN, and it allows to do absolutely fantastic things uh, without reducing performance, uh, easily protecting systems, making smooth connection to the different systems from mobile devices, from web uh, services, 
from from uh, from laptops and uh, desktop devices and uh, connecting different systems through internet in the much more secure, cheap, and efficient way. So um, I would recommend just uh, critically revise what you have on the network and uh, see if the same problem or the same task can be re-engineered and uh, re result in a bit different, maybe much more efficient way compared to what we did five years ago, 10 years ago. So. Um, also mentioned today during the first uh, session, uh, software updates, not talking on, uh, about DHS2, but about the whole system stack. Uh, vulnerable software is one of the like, biggest problems. And uh, for basic security maintenance, it's quite easy to keep it automatically updated. So for most of the systems, you have built-in tools, uh, for example, Unattended upgrades on Linux, uh, Windows update uh, services, uh, WS, SUS uh, on Windows, all mobile devices typically can upgrade, so you can uh, relatively easier compared to the old days maintain at least the new security standard. I think that if you have uh, automated updates for the server stack uh, switched on, you reduce the probability of security incidents like by 50, 60 percent. So it, it comes almost for free because the amount of the critical vulnerabilities that come um, is re re is very huge, and uh, it is much easier to install updates rather than to mitigate these incidents individually. Um, the cost of vulnerability or the price for attack becomes higher and higher on one side, and the more and more people are interested in finding new vulnerabilities, selling them to the criminal actors or using them for like bad purposes. So it means that this market is growing and more and more um, vulnerabilities are found every day. And uh, without automated updates, it is not practically possible to uh, keep uh, the large, at least especially the large fleet of servers uh, secure. Um, you all know this, of course, collect event logs. And uh, even if they don't uh, cover everything, at least uh, having some logs and looking for, into them from time to time, time is a good practice. Um, what we typically suggest, uh, once you have your system and DHS logs set up, or you use a default setup, we suggest you to connect to DHS2, log in into the system, make some actions, for example, change your password uh, and log out. And then go into the logs and see if you can detect your actions, if you can trace back to these actions and see who, was it you to change this password or is there any indication who changed the password? Right? Or ask questions, uh, who has changed the passwords in the system during the last 24 hours, or who has logged in during this time, who was using some admin privileges, uh, impersonation, and so on. So, so mm, this type of checks help to ensure that you have an up-to-date configuration and that you have a, um, a kind of a reliable way to investigate in case of incidents or at least find out some potential problems early. Um, number nine is ask for a second opinion. And uh, sometimes it is a requirement as we also discussed, so penetration testing, external penetration testing, but uh, security is a non-trivial domain. And we always recommend to talk to peers, to colleagues, uh, to network, uh, ask us as well. So we can, if you have any security related questions, we can, we can just uh, write to security at dhs2.org and whatever is related to the uh, security of the DHS2 or implementation support, we will be probably capable of answering within a reasonable timeline. And uh, we talked uh, today that uh, hackers are advancing their skills. They are becoming more and more professional. They use more and more new modern tools 
And uh, in the same ways as we upgrade our computers, get more uh, RAM and the CPU power, the same applies to our brain as well. So we swore to have a subscription to some news feeds to learn about security, uh, listen to podcasts, uh, Twitter, whatever you prefer, uh, follow like security experts uh, online and uh, learn, talk to colleagues uh, as well and to ask uh, about some security advice and understand what's going on, what are the changes in the industry as well. It helps quite a lot. Do you have any questions? Um, some time ago, uh, we were making a list of most typical security misconfigurations. And we also offered, during the training, we offered implementers uh, set up DHS2 setup with some vulner vulnerabilities in place. Or we said uh, this is a one random setup made by someone. Uh, can you find what are the most typical? and the most dangerous vulnerabilities there. So eventually we came up with a list of most common misconfigurations or the things that um, may be problematic from the security perspective. And uh, I think it's a good uh, essence to check as your setup and see if you have it implemented. And more importantly, we will going through the list, we will be not focusing only on what's bad, but about how to fix it and uh, what kind of security implications uh, these vulnerabilities may have. Um, and uh, we start talking about passwords again, mm, famous or infamous topic. Um, so everyone knows that we should use multi-factor, but uh, if we can't do that, uh, you have different options. So how how to, let's go a bit deeper and understand how this mechanic mechanics work. So um, traditionally, we consider that the password is a secret, and the user doesn't or the attacker doesn't know the password. So what the attacker can do, he can try brute forcing the password. And uh, in order to do brute forcing nowadays, um, you can either go with a random passwords, just brute forcing and uh, applying every single check to starting point, two passwords, three, four, five, six, so on. And uh, if you do that um, on the default setup of DHS2, you'll probably get hit by or some kind of a basically configured. It will be hit by the rate limiting feature, uh, or if someone has implemented uh, rate limiting on the reverse proxy or with the web application firewall, it will be like, the, this user will be stopped there. So um, the attacker then, as we also mentioned, he will try not to go the, through the front door, he will try some kind of a back door. And uh, if there is a service that is authenticated using the same password, you can try to do some kind of a reconnaissance or intelligence and try to see if you can find another system in the same domain or in the same organization that is not protecting with the rate limiting. Or to find the user with a weak password or to find the way to guess more passwords using different systems. So even if your rate limiting on DHS2 is in place, or even if you have two factor, probably someone else on other system is using the same username and password uh, without protection. And you can potentially, if you can't go to DHS2 directly to brute force the account, you can do it through different service. Or another opportunity is to do it through API directly. So there is, if there is a API endpoint that is used for some integrations, 
if some finds it and tries to brute force, API, uh, APIs sometimes have a more lax or rules on how to uh, approach, uh, how to deal with rate limiting because they're intended for uh, high intensive automated use. So uh, sometimes it is possible to brute force uh, passwords or credentials, other credentials through the API endpoint directly. So, and we also reiterate that it's important to know your attack, attack surface and what other systems are present in the system and think not only in terms of the VHS2 security, but looking into the other systems that are on the same network and may be weaker than your system. Um, those who use SSH keys for authentication, it's better not to keep them in files, but use uh, trusted platform modules. So uh, every modern laptop has a built-in PPM that is used for at least for BitLocker encryption on Windows, or can additionally store security keys on, on the system. So it can be used as a password storage, it can be used as, as a certificate or private key storage, and it can be used for various types of authentication. So um, most of the laptops do have that. Most, and in the old days, or since up to the very, very recent times, uh, the TPM model was a kind of a separate chip on the motherboard. Nowadays, at least for AMD processors, it is built in into the processor itself. And once you buy a computer uh, that is at least, or maybe six, uh, was uh, released or assembled six to 12 months from now, it will be like with a 90% guarantee we have a built-in PPM disregarding the model price and so on. So what started as a premium feature now is a kind of essential one because it's related to the hard disk encryption, it's related to different trusted operation within the kernel and uh, the operating system kernel, so you can you know, use it for storing storing the keys. Typically, if you look on the uh, compact disk or the website for the motherboard vendor or the device vendor, you will see some drivers and utilities for using the TPM for keeping the keys there. Um, the main problem we have here is that if the attacker is able to get on your device and control. He can extract the keys if they're stored in the file system, but they can do that if they're stored in the secure memory on the external key or the And uh, one more consideration, I think it is kind of gradually changing. The new security standards also require that all admins or people who have like uh, uh, maintenance or uh, admin access to the system, they must use uh, hardware tokens or keys for authenticating th themselves. So just password or a multi-factor with a mobile authenticator is not enough. Um, we also discussed uh, lack of security updates and uh, how to deal them. Um, related to updates, uh, there, there are different strategies. And uh, um, I think if everything should be done a bit ca cautiously and uh, what can go wrong with the updates. Um, on Windows, you know that Microsoft uh, is releasing updates uh, once a month, unless it is emergency updates. And it's called, I think, Patch Tuesday, one day per month when they release all, all the updates for operating systems. So it means that uh, if you have the automatic update enabled after this day, uh, all the system get the systems get updates within 24 to 72 hours. Um, so for your Windows systems, uh, it is important to remember this date and check from time to time that these updates work properly and that they don't cause issues on your setups. Uh, there were cases when the automated updates stopped working or the updates received for the automated update tool, they uh, broke some compatibility. Typically, it is related to printers or networking services and other things. There was nothing really severe, but uh, at least it is important to keep in mind about this schedule and uh, also subscribe to some Microsoft news feed for 
vulnerabilities for lab so servers. Um, for Linux systems, um, automated upgrades, especially if you run Debian or Ubuntu, they are quite solid, they are quite reliable, and uh, typically um, you don't need to do anything once configured. So uh, they are released as soon as the vulnerability is discovered, and uh, typically within 24 hours you receive this update. What is important to remember is that uh, on many of the Linux systems, uh, the update, the automatically installed update will also upgrade some configuration files. And in order to ensure that the upgrade is smooth, uh, you probably should like check from time to time that there are no breaking changes in the updates and that you don't, uh, or that you follow the operating system standard as much as possible to keep the um, all settings uh, in one place tidy rather than spreading it across the system, not to create situations where automated upgrade mechanism will be kind of surprised to see the incompatible settings and so on. So uh, making, yeah, and then we, here we should make a quick detour on general system hardening. Um, one of the very popular questions is, oh, we have our Linux server, and we would like to make a hardening using a CSS benchmark or different standards that are available. Uh, does it help? And the answer is yes and no. Yes, because these recommendations are generally good. They're battle proven. They are compliant with different security requirements in multiple countries, and uh, they are really improving the security. At the same point of time, um, any change uh, that comes with these hardening tools or recommendations is a kind of a deviation from the standard setup. And uh, let's imagine that uh, this, uh, the developers of the systems, they are testing the standard setup and they may maybe test some configuration options. And if you introduce too many different changes into the security setup, it can lead to some unpredicted behavior that was not the standard one that may probably not well tested. And you need you really need to understand and dig and research, especially as always with open source into what you're doing. And if this kind of security hardening will bring more harm rather than benefits. So um, I'm a big fan of like hardening systems, but I would really discourage you to just to run all kinds of the checklists uh, without proper checking before what they do and understanding the impact, which is not so well. So uh, this is just a heads up. That's why the most secure configuration is the default one with some essential recommended security settings. And the last part of it, if you go to any website of Postgres, Tomcat, Linux operating systems, uh, and many other products, including DHS2, we have either a hardening guide, either there's, there's, there is this hardening guide, a security guide, or security recommendations that are um, explaining what the system developers think on the of their secure setup and how to implement at least the baseline security minimum there. Um, two things here. Uh, Encryption is a kind of a default thing, but we still need setups where people connect to DHS2 using HTTP. Mm, it is not enforced by default because you need to acquire certificates from, from somewhere, let's script or any vendor. Um, the problem is that the um, it's not only about sniffing the context, but it's also about modifying the, con uh, the concept. So in uh, there were cases that in certain countries, uh, on the mobile network operator level, uh, there was some malicious content injected because the infrastructure was not reliable and the attackers were able to monitor and modify the traffic coming through the mobile operator's network. So uh, HTTPS guarantees that security settings were applied uh, and you have encrypted data within within uh, your connection and uh, nobody can mo modify it uh, on the fly. 
Um, also, if you have two configurations uh, for HTTP and HTTPS, it's important to check that they're both consistent if you have to use both. And uh, people often, for example, change security settings for HTTPS set up on the web browser and they don't do it for HTTP. So uh, there is a more relaxed access control or lack of access control on HTTP. On HTTP. And uh, this brings some inconsistency and potential security issues. The same, by the way, applies if you run both IPv4 and IPv6. Uh, half of the implementers forget that uh, configuring IPv6 uh, security firewall should work also for IPv6 and so on. So it's uh, also one, one more thing to remember. Um, this is what we discussed today. So uh, if the client IP address is not passed to the backend uh, due to misconfigured HTTP headers, uh, we are not able to detect the distinguished users and the incorrect or inaccurate information goes to the the DHS to log files. So um, depending on what header we're talking about, there are different types of issues, but uh, at least uh, X4.4 should be configured. And if you lack uh, foster X4.4 proto uh, headers uh, on the reverse proxy, it means that uh, the traffic can be rerouted or in the, in the wrong way or the security can be downgraded on this connection. Um, running Tomcat as a dedicated user is a must. It's an important requirement. So if uh, there are other users that are shared group with Tomcat or there is a user uh, that is used for different uh, access uh, compared to Tomcat, means that this user will also have a, or group will have access to the DHS to the data, which might be not desired. So one user, one group is a you know, one service is a kind of a default setting for all the system services on Linux. And if you don't change the default setup, it should be fine. Um, also, it seems to be kind of a secondary problem, but restricting access to the database or if you run multiple services with DHS2 and have a database on one server, a web application proxy on another or reverse proxy and uh, web application server on the third one. Uh, if you don't restrict network connections and you have a lack of uh, brute forcing or lack of uh, protection or lack of authorization means that at least one of these companies can be probably attacked more than others and they can get an additional attack vector there. Same applies to the weak database password. So if there is a chance that someone will connect to the database directly, uh, we always need to ensure that the password is quite secure because brute forcing the password on the database is much easier, typically much easier. And uh, if nobody thinks about this from day one. The same for unencrypted connection to the backend. Well, you can have uh, HTTPS between your users and your data center, but within data centers, the connections are not encrypted. Uh, if you don't control the whole environment and you're not sure who is on your network, probably a good idea is to encrypt the connection between the HS2 and the database and between the Tomcat front end, uh, front, front end and reverse proxy and Tomcat. Um, one uh, more thing about using most recent software. Um, th this is uh, two pictures uh, have default network security or HTTPS TLS setup for Ubuntu 18 and Ubuntu 22. So if you set up uh, both systems are have long-term support. So it means that they should be secure in the default configuration. If you if you set, set up them just downloading and configuring with default settings. Uh, if you do this configuration on Ubuntu 18 and run DHS2 behind the Nginx proxy and configure a SL certificate, 
and test it for security with this website, you will get to a grade B with several security vulnerabilities in place. If you do it on the most recent uh, Ubuntu 22 LTS, you will get the fairly good grade A. You can get also A plus for new systems. Um, but it's just to demonstrate that the modern software has more protection than the old one. So it's not necessarily about upgrading, but if you can use the new versions or can you keep up and still new versions of everything in your infrastructure, it's better to use them unless you have any performance or like other considerations. It's not to upgrade. And LTS support eventually ends. And uh, uh, the last important thing here uh, is learn about vulnerabilities early. So I mentioned that uh, all major vendors have uh, their vulnerability news feeds. There are shared news feeds. We are also like sending notification uh, to our implementers. So um, if uh, you can, for example, subscribe to the full disclosure mailing list that notifies about all kinds of the vulnerabilities, specifically for Ubuntu, maybe Postgres, Tomcat, and others. And we have our own security notification list that we were present early notification about potential vulnerabilities. And as we are quite a secure application, we don't spam you, so we typically send it once or two times per year. That's all for this presentation. And uh, if you have any questions or use cases to discuss, we can do it right away. Yes, please. Can we try and observe which user playing, but if we log in, we have to log in detail. Last updated by this one, but what is actually is to like into data and a data set or data element or things like that. I think you have a previous value and new value in the logs, in the audit log. Yeah. Yeah. So you can see uh, what kind of the data was changed, but uh, maybe it doesn't apply to all operations, but if if you have audit log, you can see which user changed what kind of data. Right? It might be hard to tell what operation was it, but at least you will, you will see that. Now, if it is not enabled by, or if it is audit log, you need to enable it separately if you'd like to connect because it previously came to the database and uh, it was a kind of an extra load for the database because of the nature of the operations, but now you have it in the file uh, and uh, it is more performance uh, lightweight. Um, from the previous session, there was a request to discuss uh, one more thing that I will share it. Again, so um, Yeah, so uh, we proposed uh, this thing some time ago, we, uh, uh, more specifically last year, but uh, uh, that version didn't get a really good feedback. So now we are doing it once again. Um, Okay, so um, 
we have created a data access agreement, uh, which is a uh, legal, but still very, very affordable or like easy to understand agreement between uh, any organization that uses DHS2 and uh, contractors or his groups or support or implementers, anyone who can uh, access the systems and do some maintenance work, consulting and other things. And uh, the idea was that uh, we would like to put some legal framework and safeguards around access to the systems and ensure that both the organization and the contractor are kind of a bound by some terms. And uh, this is a kind of a template. It's a, something that you can use, ad adapt in, in your organizations. It was legally reviewed as well. Uh, so can be changed, improved and so, and so on, but at least it has a bare minimum of the things. We highlighted with the yellow things that you clearly want to, uh, to change in, in your case, but I suggest to go through this agreement and to see what it tells. And there were some, in the, in the last uh, um, weeks, uh, I've got several requests about it and I think it's worth looking into. So um, this is a data access agreement between um, some organization and the consultant in the broad sense. And uh, we suggest that it is an individual agreement between an organization and a consultant because the responsibility for access is individual. And uh, depending on the contractor's uh, consultant location, there can be quite a lot of cases. And from the organization perspective, you would like to know the specific person who had done something in your system rather than to have, in addition to all kinds of the um, regular support contract, you would like to have an agreement that focuses on security and privacy and the uh, general use of data. So it's not a kind of a support agreement where you have fees, uh, uh, kind of a SLA and other things, but it's a data access agreement with focus on security and privacy. That's why it's uh, between an organization and a person. Um, we um, say that We follow data privacy laws in both jurisdictions. And it's important not to list because I may be living in the United States, the uh, organization may be in Europe or anywhere in Asia, but we are saying that both parties are following the laws and both of the laws apply, which is the most kind of a common, common, common situation. And uh, despite the fact that the definition of personal data is different in many countries, uh, it still makes sense to include as much as possible here. Uh, we introduce uh, some initial definitions for what's happening. And uh, it has a strong focus on personal data because um, under almost any personal data protection act, uh, a party that process personal data, both their organization and the consultant, they have certain obligations in case of the case of the data breach. So uh, this kind of language protects uh, us. So then do you list the purposes of what actually the consultant is doing uh, and tasks, and you list in any form, any activities that will be performed. You can list as many as you want. Uh, we took some common examples, uh, use cases, and uh, it may be as many as you want. Um, period of access is self-explanatory. We always suggest doing it on a limited time basis. It can be as long as you want, but uh, just to have a infinite time for, for access. And uh, two things that are allowed and disallowed. So list things explicitly. Both lists can be empty, but uh, typically you can put it into the agreement that you don't allow the consultant to reboot the system or to do some kind of a sensitive operation without your consent, without extra procedures. And uh, it is useful for the cases where, for example, the consultant trying to prove something makes it worse. And uh, it also like, guarantees that both parties have read and agreed on certain procedure and how to access and use data. 
and uh, then uh, there are the there is a series of access clause with, which explains what should happen once we stop the access that the credentials are revoked data is re returned if there is a physical uh, media for keeping the data and uh, more important is that there is no resharing of the data so once the party uh, got access uh, further resharing within with colleagues, friends within the organization is not the subject of that uh, agreement. And for any further resharing, we need to get this explicit permission from the data owner. Mm. And uh, the data is confidential, of course. And one more, uh, these things are measured during by the privacy laws, but we don't focus on privacy itself. We just focus on regular day-to-day -day security routines. And the uh, useful thing is uh, number 15. It is the data security of the consultant's uh, laptop to ensure that people who access, uh, they don't decrease the security of the target system. So requiring to use uh, strong passwords, uh, encryption, having antivirus installed and so on and so on. And uh, also if the incident has happened and the consultant becomes aware of that, we should report it, about it as soon as possible. That's it. So it is, a, as I mentioned, it's a heavily revised version of what we had before and uh, it's publicly available. Uh, I think we need to put uh, license on it to ensure that you can freely copy, modify, and uh, reuse it. Uh, but before doing that and doing an official release, so if you have a need of such kind of agreement internally, I suggest to make a copy, download, uh, I'll share, the, the, the link to agreement is, is in the Q&A document for the first session, and uh, you can download it and use, uh, and uh, if you have any feedback, we can discuss and improve it. Uh, that's all from my side for today. So uh, if you have uh, any further questions, uh, I can answer. Yes. Yeah. I, can I ask uh, who here has had to share access to data to the data system? Who has Probably most people. Uh, what about access to the server, SSH access to the server with someone to post down? Um, Google once. Yeah. <laughs> never uh, did it before. Uh, never, never did it after. <laughs> okay, so if, if you get the data access, if you share shared access to data to uh, with another organization or something, uh, a login to data to, for example, um, in the past or, or in export the database, anything. Like that, put your hand back up and you know, the people have their hand up before. How many of you put your hand down? Let's keep it, keep your hand up, keep your hand up. Uh, how many of you put your hands down if you have, uh, if you had something like this in place when you shared that? <laughs> so, everybody else here probably could use this. <laughs> Uh, I think the, the, it's something that's often overlooked, but it's very important to have, even just just to you know go through the process and, and think about like <clears throat> what am I doing here? What am I giving someone access to, and who's getting access to what? Um, you, you need to think about that, and then you need to have some record of that this was shared with this person. They agreed that this is how they're going to use that data. They're not going to sell it to someone else. All of those types of things, right? Um, so I think it's, it's very important. To, uh, Sorry? Yes, it's uh, in the document, uh, so, that Q&A document, it's linked there, yeah, and uh, you can just access it online from the document that we shared for the previous session, and uh, once we get the conference materials, we'll provide the link, and uh, if you still didn't get it, you can write to security at dhs2.org, and we'll share a copy at once. I, I have one question, but this might be for the whole space. Yeah. Sorry, but I have to leave. Uh, <laughs> <laughs>
So the concern is uh, we, we share VHS to uh, tracker data, personal data, because some uh, is the idea is uh, they need uh, the whether she taking any services and against that they receive some money from. So the, the problem is they don't need the service, but when we give the API access, they can also replace the service, which actually is rich to the data agreement. If we cannot restrict current modality, we cannot restrict certain things. So they also need their ID, yeah, registration number, national ID, mobile number, might be name to verify. That's, that's it. Only attributes might be, and whether they are taking service or not. So whether there's any possibility, because currently we what we are using earlier 36, now 39, there is no such functionality. So they can access by API. If I give to certain user to data access, so we give as a group, which is certain to specific program. And sometimes program stays, not beyond. So that we cannot limit the specific data element to the specific user today. So whether that's possible, because in that case, the he or she might uh, ask for the service data. Currently, it's not maybe a concern because it's a maternal data, but it's in a way it's a HIV or the sensitive information that's put in this case. Great question. Um, it depends a little bit how you model your, your system. There are, there are ways to restrict access to specific uh, users, obviously, using the caring credit role. Um, in some cases, if you, if you have sort of the information not segregated uh, enough, it might be difficult to separate them. So if you get all of the information from the program stages, you don't have care access to the program stages, there can be things. I don't know, to bear in mind, have some, some uh, insight of this on the tracker to develop a side of well. But there are other ways to go about it as well, right? If you, if you want to lock that down, you can uh, export the data in some other way. So you export it, you filter it, and you get only the data that you need. You put it on a, in a CSV file or give them a, an access to a, a shim API. So you don't give them direct access to the event here. You can give them access to just the data that they need. And then you generate that on a daily basis. Um, but there are other ways to go about that as well. It might also be, I know we're working on kind of doing a, a review of uh, the authorities that are in the system uh, and probably also the, the different types of objects that can be shared to have granular access control. Um, so it's definitely something we can look into. John, raise your hand back. Is it better? It would be better, but I don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, just like on the, the following up on like how do we share the access, but in now like we did this uh, during the COVID, we had to share the data to uh, the RKYC company, which is was part of our working under the Ministry of Education. And it's a private company which has uh, all the mobile data and their personal things. So, but then the like, Ministry of Health is giving the COVID access certificate, right? And they wanted them to be used in the in their app. So what they did was is to they can search in DHRS2 based on the ID number and other things, and then they download the COVID certificate data, or they made an app so that like the, the people can download the COVID certificate in their app. How it happened was the backend services which do made and we allowed the same principle. So it's not we are not they are not access directly to DHRS2 at all. So we have given only you can search for these three fields only via a, a backend services. So, and then like we had a token and all different things, we don't give them the access to the HRS department. So again, it's the, the same thing when you do the integration with other people, like we also need to make sure that the security model and everything we, we have. In Before long time back, what we used to do is to create this uh, username and password with very less read-only access and give it to them, right? That we have stopped. Right now, we only use this the token-based thing so that like, you can exactly you know whether it is a system system or a person, it's better to switch from the older implementation where we give them the username password they look in the system. So I guess we are moving towards in a good way, but these agreements are also be, should be in place. Uh, this is a technical document, uh, actually a document where people can read, but like in the backward, like the developers and things, we are managing it, but there is no actual document, like I said, this is the, the things what we have been agreed on. So that's, I guess, like it's very nice things to, to implement in the country level.
in COVID actually we do the same thing. So when we are still to the middleware, we limit the access because because of this restriction. But uh, for the certification, we have we have no integration go for anything but set set up. So that's different. But uh, from this case, we now in the days we get a lot of requests. So this is come from the Ministry of Commerce actually. So they want the different. So if there's official in you like this uh, data agreement, if they signed it, so we have to give it. But the problem is we don't want to because uh, to be too bad, not to want to develop something. Why? Because two things. They want to filter, which already they have the interest earlier, so they don't take it so that the money cannot be given twice or something. But even because of the down, so there's something logic at the end, so that we don't want to. But when we try to do, we find the problem is in data team. So, so ideally, we can have the data be not in a group. You see, the user group will give the individual user access to the specific attributes. But there is some issues. So, the API will say that this actually doesn't work. Also, you need to create the SQL view for that data team and you have API, you can get the data. But suppose you have required 20 data elements. Particular. Then you can create a right expression for that and then you can pull the API and, it, and also you can use the role list to the role and SQL team. And they can get shared on the platform. It's the base to be doing all the things. There are a few different ways to go about it. That's true. And yet, SQL will also be the same Initially, in before 2.32, there is a uh, uh, another uh, one separate table, uh, that is the data table. After two point two point three two, there is a one only one bonus the next time. Yeah. Then we have to make sure and we have to knowledge about the JSON query or how to write the JSON query. Then you get the particular data elements. So otherwise, mess up because this is a knowledge of object writing query. Yeah. But can we create an attribute as well? Yeah, 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 attributes is easily, but in, in the case of the data elements, yes, don't okay. and also using the attributes, there is a uh, filter in API. You can use the filters and accept the value of the, the attributes and the value. You can uh, get the only list of the, the, the query, that in this instance, query okay. Okay. you can use. And uh, when you are passing the, the attributes value, you get only the in the organization context, in order what you want. There's a few different ways to go about it, but uh, and there might be some ways we could improve it with the example of the Because we are using in the uh, in the Nepal or then we are using the biometric system. They use the SAP data. So we have a lot of the data security and IT management. So we have using so we have the data. Specific, some people gave you only one data element solution, they could ask for only other that. So we have like different SQL views and we need access particular users to that SQL views so, and give only one that. Uh, just to add to the question line, security after working with this implementation you know, of security, and I think security is a critical aspect of the part is important for us. So I guess security is important to us, is actually. And the is like when you are dealing with GSI2, then you also need to be very careful which user has the patient part of the zone. Right. Yeah, you know, you're big fast and different positions because of the company that are doing so how to have a problem with your technology. Then also one of the ideas to set the IP policy because this thing is possible just on our slide. Sometimes it will do projects like you have pilot server, which is just for development, but they, they use it for filing maybe a month or so, but they can shift it to a production. But they normally forget that they still have real data in the pilot. Even for to assess that data, there has to be some DSA or data sharing agreement or square agreements. It has to be there. This is some files I see that people over. Because at that time, cost is very low. So, as you know, it's very much being high. But continuously, the project is going to be delivered, and they need to have this to actually something to us on. So, this is something that we all really have to work here. Thank you.
All right. Yeah, my, my comment was that uh, for these cases that we just discussed with access control, I think we uh, I have a microphone here. Yeah. So I think we probably need the library of typical solutions of, of how to do access control based yeah. on the use cases. And this is where we really need your feedback because, for example, John shared their experience. You have your own setup and uh, probably we could build some templates or recommended or like not recommended <laughs> list of things to do there, not to, to do or not to do because uh, it's a complicated area. And once you start, it typically develops quite organically. And uh, um, once you have an access control model with granted permissions, it is a bit too late to redo all the things because people are already working and you have set, set up. And building these rules or using the best practice, it, I think it can save quite a lot of time and uh, make the further maintenance easier. Yes, please. Actually, I have some query. Actually, when I am upgrading the systems, We'll give you mic. It's also for the online. Mm -hmm. When I am upgrading uh, the systems from uh, version to version, the client always asks for full security of the certificates. And we have, uh, they have a uh, different agency or different uh, tools for auditing the uh, applications. So we are getting the lots of issue and fixing the in house development. And my question is that in the future details, is there any one question is then capture in login screen? There is a uh, two factor multiplication, but some you are asked uh, about the capture. There is a capture in the details, but self registration you have required, but there is no login capture. We use the Google capture or mm -hmm. another capture. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, when you're using the JavaScript the type capture, they not pass in the security audit. They, and then you either use the Google authentication, you do HP before either mm. on the design. But in details, there is no. And one question is if there is a concurrent login. Suppose one user ABC is logging in the Chrome browser, and same user can log in same time in the uh, Mozilla. Mm -hmm. This is uh, violating security. In the details, there is no option for this. Yeah. Another is the uh, another is the error page. Suppose uh, users type uh, wrong URLs. They show the your Tomcat uh, uh, informations for them some expect uh, exceptions or maybe in Java files lots of error. This is also so we have to create the another error page. Suppose you writing anything, we can show this error. So they we have developed on, but in details there is no. So. Mm -hmm. This is the requirements. And one is the, uh, when suppose the uh, one user changes password. And after the password, there is a no uh, session, there is a already session for that. In the backend, the password change, but user can use same session uh, with the previous password. Hmm. Yeah, I, I have and some no, comments. Uh, one thing on this is the uh, SQL injection. Yeah. Yeah, you have to pass the uh, backend, suppose you're writing something, URM password, not URM password, uh, URM password and something else, and the login to the We can block the internally on in house development work, but in data is the issue. So I think in future in versions it can be possible for that because on one thing more out, uh, you should like that. Suppose that we have created one user, limit user data as the operator, and uh, you have not assigned the some uh, well model like uh, reports or report X, but the intelligent users maybe uh, open the another tab and uh, 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 paste the net details with Import export. They they have no access, but they can uh, use uh, easily or they can open these this model. This is a plugin details. In the two point three eight, you have uh, the ABC security audit testing. The some users do. Uh, they have not access to import export, export app, but they can open the import export apps to another app mm -hmm. using the UI. So that is not actually a security call uh, because you, you're just seeing the. No, no, uh, wait. Uh, but uh, when did you 
uh, the agency can uh, do this. They, they have a uh, security audit uh, tools, uh, and this tool violates this this type of issue. Maybe it's the application issues, or maybe, but it is uh, uh, because this is they they not pass this security audit certification, and you cannot push this DHS application to the server. Um. The first immediate comment before Austin answers, <laughs> before I remember. So there were quite a few issues that we mentioned. Could you please send them to us uh, in some like email or a form? Because I've heard uh, several important ideas to follow up and uh, it would be great. Or either we can just uh, sync up uh, after the session and just write it down because uh, there are many of them. I pr probably can misinterpret them yeah i have a, uh, something to comment but also you want to... okay okay so uh immediate one on uh so on capture i did not catch uh, maybe we don't have it uh, everywhere we don't have it at all probably we have it we, we, we have we have it all. yeah oh, yeah yeah um regarding the second one which is about uh for probably protecting or prohibiting lo login from other browsers once you have a session. Um, I think that uh, it's uh, it's a, it's not a feature, it's how internet works from, from our perspective. So um, you can theoretically restrict access to one IP address, but it will be very hard to restrict to one browser or especially to one session reliably because you need to rely in this case on something on the, on the client side. And a kind of a sophisticated client can always, for example, take a cookie from uh, your Chrome browser, put it into Mozilla, and continue use, using the system in the same in the same way. So uh, there is no reliable way to um, prohibit this. And more importantly, once you prohibit it in any way, for example, limiting by one IP address or limiting by uh, user agent or by browser, it is much easier to lock out a user. For example your browser crashes and then you reopen the page you try to log in and then you get a new session but your previous session for from the server perspective it's still running it means that your user is locked out for a time before the session expires and if your session doesn't expire for a day it means that they can't log in for a long time so there is a lot of like complicated mechanics here please uh, i'm done um, <laughs> so we, we have a maximum concurrent session setting in the yeah. in the DHS vault, which allows you to set the time to one, for example. And then if you log into one browser and then you log into the other browser, it will log out your previous session as soon as you log into the one. So that, that 